Hi everyone. In a previous release, I have provided an overview of DNA topology, speaking briefly of superhelical density or supercoiling, in fact, of circular DNA molecules. So as you know, topological properties of DNA are defined by the linking number, LK or L or alpha, that is equated to the twist or the number of turns and the right or the number of supercoils. That concept of supercoiling applies as well to linear DNA molecules whose end are not free to rotate in order to eliminate or dissipate this extra strain resulting from additional or fewer turns, like all eukaryotic uh, chromosomes. So I told you that when we deal with circular DNA molecules, we refer to the same DNA molecule having different linking numbers or what we call different degrees of supercoiling as topoisomers. These structures are complex, no doubt. And the ones that are negatively supercoiled, I told you, uh, they are energetically favorable for the biochemical processes involving DNA. I'm referring here to DNA replication, transcription, and recombination. Why is that? Because the negatively supercoiled DNA will help unwinding the molecule to initiate the process. Now, negatively supercoiled DNA can unwind locally, and that favors the formation of other complex DNA structures. So in this short presentation, I will speak briefly of complex DNA structures and their functional roles, as well as their translational values, since, as you know, and as I will tell you, that some of them are likely to be involved in human disease. First of all, I'm Professor Farnas from the Lebanese University in Beirut, and down you can see my private website. You are all invited to visit. The website features a number of advanced courses for graduate and postgraduate, as well as for physicians and other professionals in the biological sciences field. So you can subscribe and you will be notified of every single new uh, post or publication. Very well. So to start, in fact, this presentation about complex DNA structures and their translational insight, I will focus first on what we call cruciforms and palindrome. So what are palindrome? You know, palindromes are words or sentences that are spelled the same way, backward or forward, such as radar or noon, as you can see here. Now, a palindromic sequence at the level of DNA, in fact, is nothing else than a pair of inverted repeats. And as I will show you here, the sequence with the two arrows are running in opposite direction. So you can see the two inverted repeats separated by a sort of spacer here. So these palindromic sequences or palindromes have the potential to form a tertiary structure that is known as a cruciform. I will show you the cruciform to the right here. So when interstrand based pairing is replaced with intrastrand based pairing, the palindrome is converted into a pair of herpins together form the uh, cruciform. So you can see the two complementary uh, sequences at the level of each strand that uh, come together to form this herpin, where we have the stem for the uh, base pair regions together with the loop corresponding to those, in fact, nucleotides that are projected outside of the, of the herpin. Very well. So these structures display what we call two-fold rotational symmetry, and each palindromic sequence can adopt two possible conformation depending on the condition. So the linear structure shown to the left with interstrand, in fact, hydrogen bonding, or the cruciform shown to the right with intrastrand hydrogen bonding. Very well. So you should remember that such cruciform are never as stable as the normal DNA duplexes. However, their formation 
tend to relieve what we call torsional stress of negatively supercoiled DNA. You should note that negatively supercoiled DNA can lead to local unwinding, and this will promote the formation of cruciform, as you can see on this slide. So it's well known that palindromic sequences occur in many regulatory sequences, and obviously they fulfill an important role, potentially producing distinctive recognition site for regulatory uh, proteins. On this slide, we have a number of repeats, four major types of repeats in genomic DNA sequences. The arrows corresponding to the base sequences indicate the organization and orientation of the repeat. For instance, starting from the top, we have direct repeats, where the two repeats have the same orientation on the same strand. We have uh, the inverted repeats, as you can see, with self-complementary sequences. Inverted repeats, the two repeats have the same orientation on two different strands, and mirror repeat down, as you can see, the two sequences run in opposite orientation on the same strand. It's good to have one more slide to distinguish between palindrome and mirror repeat, because when the inverted repeats occur within each individual strand of DNA, then the sequence is called a mirror repeat. So remember, mirror repeats do not have complementary sequences within the same strand and cannot form herpin or cruciform structure. The second complex DNA structure that we will deal with in this presentation is the three-stranded DNA structure or DNA triplex, also called H-DNA or simply we refer to as a triplex. Those DNA triplexes have been characterized three decades ago. H-DNA are formed, by the way, by homopurin, homopyridin, mirror repeats. The formation of H-DNA is equivalent to an unwinding of the entire mirror repeat, homopurin, homopyridin repeat. Then one strand, the homopurin or homopyridin, will fold back and purse with the homopurin strand of the normal, a classic, before mirror repeat the one that is still uh, base purred. In a reversed fashion, through unusual base purring, we call Hugestein bonds. Hugestein bonds. So here we have a realistic representation of H-DNA or triplex. And as I told you, the formation of the triplexes depend on this uh, phenomenon of non-conventional base purring that we call Hugestein base purring. And it's good to, rem to remind you that this occurs without disruption of what's on the creek base purse. It should have been 10 years after the publication of DNA double helix by Watson and Crick that the scientist Karst Hugestein reported a crystal structure of a complex in which analogs of A and T formed a base pur having different geometry than that described by Watson and Crick. Similarly, an alternative base purring geometry can occur between G and C pairs. With those, in fact, alternative hydrogen bonding patterns of the double helix, Hogestein proposed that DNA could assume a quite different shape. For instance, <clears throat> if you look at the triplex structure on this a slide, you can see on the top the, uh, the Watson Crick classical hydrogen bonds versus Hugustein in the middle. So, Hugustein base pair uses, as you can see, the nitrogen seven. The nitrogen seven, you can see here, atom as the acceptor rather than the nitrogen one as observed in Watson Crick base pairing. This will lead to a twisted nonlinear arrangement. And down, you can see how it's possible for the nucleobases of one strand of the mirror repeat that can be held together by hydrogen bonds in the major groove of the double helix leading to what we call DNA triplex or H-DNA. On this slide, you have two different patterns of H-DNA depending on which strand of the unfolded or unwound 
uh, mirror repeat will fall back. So if the homo homopyrin, as you can see on the top, is folding back and base pairing with the homopurin of the intact mirror repeat, so we have the H, in fact, DNA, YRY pattern, or we have the other alternative, the, uh, the uh, folding of the homopurin uh, strand back, and as you can see, it base pairs with the homopurin of the intact mirror repeat, forming the RRY pattern. So two different patterns as shown on this slide. Now, remember that DNA triplex is formed when pyridine or purine bases occupy the major groove of the DNA double helix, forming what we call Hugestein pairs with the purines of the, of the watson creek base pairs. So in DNA of living cells, the sites recognized by many sequence-specific DNA binding proteins are arranged as palindromes and mirror repeats, polypyrin, polypurin, and other repeat sequences. These regions can form, as I told you, cruciform triple helices or HDNA, and we have a third complex structure that we call G quadruplex, we will come to later on. So these unusual structures are found within regions involved in the regulation of expression of some eukaryotic genes. Repeat sequences, by the way, within the genome are also known as suicide motif for RNA polymerase. In fact, the RNA polymerase will trigger their formation as a result of DNA unwinding. So right now, we have many efforts that are devoted for the detection of DNA triplexes and other unusual DNA structures inside living cells. And we are trying to elucidate their biological roles in the normal conditions and disease. For instance, as a direct application of this knowledge, synthetic DNA strands have been designed to pair with these sequences to form triplex DNA or HDNA, because this will disrupt the gene expression. This approach, by the way, is used to uh, control metabolism, and it has growing commercial interest for its potential application in medicine and agriculture. So on this slide, you can see intermolecular triplexes that are formed between the triplex forming oligonucleotide, shown here in red, and the target sequence on duplex DNA. So the duplex DNA features, in fact, two strands, the purine-rich one, shown in blue, and the yellow-rich one, shown in, in yellow. So blue and yellow. And the TFO, or what you call triplex-forming oligonucleotide, will be able to base pair with the purine a rich nucleotide through the major groove involving Hugestein base pairing. And that triplex will block RNA polymerase, so preventing the expression of the corresponding gene. Uh, very well, before going further, we have an example of human disease associated with DNA triplex. It's the Friedrich ataxia, FRDA, Friedrich, in fact, ataxia is an autosomal recessive degenerative disorder of nervous and muscle tissues is caused by the massive expansion of the GAA repeats that occur in the first intron of frataxin gene present on chromosome 9. So you can see the expansion on the top. We have 20, in fact, repeats. And as a result of the expansion, we might have 100 of repeats. In fact, the purine strand of the DNA in the expanded GAA repeat region can fold back to form the RRY pattern of HDNA, which further inhibit the frataxin gene expression. And this shows clearly, in fact, that the shape of DNA is the determining factor in the cellular function. And I can show you very well how the formation of HDNA will prevent RNA polymerase from binding, so it blocks RNA polymerase. At the same time, we have another possibility, which is the induction of folded chromatin structure, as you can see to the right, by recruitment of some chromatin modifiers or histone modifiers like HDAC, and that will prevent or block physically the excess of RNA polymerase. In both cases, in fact, we have the gene silencing, preventing the expression of the frataxin gene.
What it does, in fact, this gene within cells, flatoxin is found in mitochondria. It appears to help assemble clusters of iron and sulfur molecules, which are critical to the function of many proteins, including those that are needed for energy production. So one result of flatoxin deficiency is in mitochondria, we have iron overload, which can cause damage to, in fact, many proteins, including those, in fact, of the of the energy pro production uh, a protein. Very well. So we move into the last unusual DNA structure that we will tackle in this presentation is the G quadruplex, which are formed within nucleic acids by sequences that are rich in guanine. So G quadruplexes have helical structures. They contain guanine tetrads. Those tetrads can form from one, two, or four strands. The one strand four, in fact, occur naturally uh, in the telomeric region at the end of the chromosomes. And uh, equally in regulatory regions of multiple genes and oncogenes. In general, as you can see down, four guanine bases can associate through hookstein hydrogen bonding to form a square, a planar structure that we call guanine tetrad or quartet. And then, as you can see to the right, two or more of guanine tetrads or quartets can stack on top of each other to form the G quadruplex. So this occurs in those, in fact, DNA regions or nucleic acid regions that are rich in guanine with high proportion of guanine. So you can see here the different tracts. So their position, in fact, and uh, organization is crucial for the formation of a G a quadruplex. So remember, the placement and bonding to form G quadruplexes are not random and serve very unusual functional purposes. Their activity now in basic genetic processes is an active area of research for gene regulation and functional genomic research. I will show you different forms of quadruplex. As I told you, it might form from one strand, two strands, or four strands. The strand direction could be parallel or anti-parallel. When it comes to the loop, it could be lateral, diagonal, diagonal uh, propeller, and we have different sizes of the loop. I will show you something very beautiful. Here we have a 3D structure of the intramolecular human telomeric G quadruplex. The backbone is represented by a tube. By the way, you can compare the G quadruplex to a sort of tower with many floors, and the corners. The four corners of each floor are occupied by a granite. So the center of the structure contains three layers of G uh, tetrads. And the uh, blue uh, dashed uh, line corresponds to the hydrogen bonds holding the uh, guanine at each level. Very well. So we can move here to this slide showing a model for quadruplex mediated down regulation of gene expression. The figure shows clearly how G quadruplexes could interfere with the gene expression because the formation of G quadruplex in the promoter, as you can see, will prevent the binding of RNA polymerase. That's simple, leading to transcription suppression. Remarkably, in fact, the RNA polymerase per se will trigger the formation of G quadruplex that will inhibit its function. Now, before going further, I would like to say that nucleic acid quadruplexes have been described for long as structures in search of function. In the human genome, tens of thousands of G quadruplexes or G4 motif containing sites have been, in fact, uh, defined. These structures are likely to play a substantial role in genome regulation and evolution. We have many studies now that implicate quadruplexes in both positive and negative transcriptional regulation and allowing a uh, programmed recombination of immunoglobin heavy genes. Let's say that S cells has, have evolved mechanisms for removing, unwinding, resolving G quadruplexes that form here and there, quadruplex formation may be potentially damaging for the cell. For this reason, we have a number of helicases. Among them, the WRN or Werner 
helicase and bloom syndrome protein helicase having high affinity for resolving G4 DNA. On this slide, we depict potential impact on essential processes of G4 DNA. Replication to the left, transcription in the middle, and local, in fact, here, unwinding, superhelicity, negative supercoiling, may expose a single-stranded region. All these processes, uh, in fact, can uh, promote the formation of G4 uh, quadruplexes. Even G4 RNA may form in the transcript of a gene carrying a G4 motif in the coding strand. Now, as you know, as you can see, G4 DNA may stall replication or transcription or prevent, as you can see to the right here, the uh, binding of a specific transcription factor. So that way you can see very well the rule of G4 uh, DNA in the different processes. And equally in human disease. So let me show you some of the factors. All of them are helicases that are associated with human diseases and bind quadruplexes. So we have a list. I will focus on two of them, the Bloom and Werner. So let me say that these helicases uh, that bind G4 quadruplexes have been already involved in human diseases. So I'm focusing on two of them because they are very well known. The uh, helicases WRN and Bloom syndrome protein as I told you, uh, they are two different, uh, two good examples because of their affinity to G quadruplexes. The deficiency, by the way, in a Bloom helicase, as you can see on the top functions, uh, leads to Bloom syndrome that is characterized by postnatal growth retardation, short stature, and increased predisposition to cancer. As a matter of fact, cells that are deficient in BLM helicase display hyperrecombination phenotype, sensitivity to replication blocking agents, and increased genomic instability. As to the Werner uh, syndrome down, it's a rare genetic disorder resulting from functional loss of the Werner helicase or WRN helicase. Werner syndrome, by the way, is characterized by premature uh, aging, genomic, uh, genomic instability, and cancer pre disposition. Before leaving this area, I would like to return to the main table uh, to show you that these helicases are involved in all different processes, like starting with XPD on the top involved in transcription, the Bloom uh, helicase involved in DNA replication, we have the initiation factor 4A involved in the translation initiation step, and we have ATRX1 uh, that is promoting epigenetic modification by remodeling uh, chromatin at the G4 motif. So uh, before ending this presentation, I would like to say uh, two words. The G4 structure formation can drive genomic instability by creating mutations, deletion, and by stimulating recombination events. So this suggests that G4 structures might support the identification of new personalized treatment approaches in the future. So G4 structures are currently tested as therapeutic targets for one major purpose to downregulate transcription or to block telomeric elongation in cancer cells. With this, I have come to the end of this presentation. If you like the presentation, if you would like to show support, if you have any question, please leave a comment. If you have any proposal for potential collaboration in the future, so please write me directly using this email. So thank you for your attention and see you next time. Goodbye.